Our third keynote, uh, who is uh, Professor John McDermott, uh, professor from York, who will speak about safety of autonomy, challenges and strategies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. After we switch technology, I hope this works because there's a couple of embedded videos in, in this. Um, so, as we rightly said, I come from the University of, of York. Um, from the beginning of this year, I've been running a, a program called uh, Assuring Autonomy International Program. I'm going to mainly talk generally, but I do want to ex explain something about that program um, towards the um, end of the talk. Um, so, I want to talk a little bit about what I mean by autonomy and robotics, give a very, very selective history of that, and then try to identify some of the challenges this brings to um, orthodox methods of dealing with system safety, and then say something about some strategies for addressing those challenges, which then leads into this uh, program um, I'm running. Um, unfortunately, actually, a couple of the, the previous speakers have said some things that I think really help for this, so I'll try to illustrate some of the points with things we've heard already. Um, English is a very subtle and complicated um, language, so when in doubt, I usually go to the Oxford English Dictionary to find out what words mean. And it says autonomy is the ability of a person to make his or her own decisions. Let's talk about self-governance, independence, um, etc. So if we're going to build an autonomous system, it actually means that the systems are making the decisions, not the human. There's a lot of current interest about this. We've heard some of the ideas, but the idea is not new. You know, electric kettles have turned themselves off for many years. It's not a complex decision, um, but it's nonetheless a decision. We have adaptive gearboxes in cars, and the little guy at the back is a bottom here is a Dyson um, vacuum cleaner, which goes and learns its way around your room to, to clean it or to make sure it leaves the dirt in a consistent place um, every time. Um, there are um, more sophisticated systems now, um, robotics and autonomous systems, that um, are used to do tasks in a cost-effective way which pro provide benefits to society. Um, so this example at the top may not be very e easy to see, but this is actually um, a warehouse um, for a supermarket who do online ordering. They used to do picking by hand. It took about two and a half hours. With this robotic system, it goes on a grid over stacked pallets. They can serve an order typically in 10 to 15 minutes. So it stops humans doing boring stuff and is much more efficient. Um, the picture lower down is um, a Japanese robot handling a 14-year-old boy who has limited uh, mobility, so giving um, independent living for people. And the shipping and driving examples I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. Um, if, if you like, this is a little bit of, of history, but I, I do want to say something uh, a little bit more about um, the, the history. Last time I gave a talk like this, I was in Italy, not very far from Vinci. This, of course, is Leonardo da Vinci, 1495, an autonomous cart. OK, it's clockwork, but it would go um, by itself. Um, you know, are, are autonomous cars recent? Who thinks um, you know, the first autonomous car was this century? this decade? Um, well, this was 1925. OK, it's not autonomous. It's actually remote controlled. So it's like a big remote controlled toy. Um, but, uh, and then in uh, Fredericksburg in Virginia a few years later, and if you see in this circle, you can see the antenna. If nothing else, it tells you antenna technology has improved quite a lot, um, <laughs> hasn't it? But um, th these were. Um, initially, I say remote controlled, but more onboard technologies have started really from around the 1940s. So it's, it's quite old. And if we look in um, things like industrial robotics, um, again, we've had these for a long period of time, but actually quite simple safety solutions. If somebody tries to um, get near the robot, they're usually protected by a fence and a gate. If I open the gate, that isolates the power and the robot movement um, halts. So you ensure personnel safety. And these principles are well understood. Many are in standards or um, EU directives of various sorts. Um, but things are moving on. Now people are trying to build a collaborative um, robots where we need to manage interaction in a more subtle fashion. If you imagine um, the little picture I had of the um, social care robot helping this small boy, um, you know, you can't put a fence 
around him, uh, make it safe and make it work. So we've got to deal with those things in a more subtle way. Now, there are some quite remarkable um, achievements, and I'll, I'll come back more to sort of maritime and um, automotive in, in a moment. I just want to show you one aerospace example. Now, having transferred machines, the question is whether or not this embedded video will work. Okay, so this is the first autonomous flight and landing from US aircraft carrier. You see what the guy in the yellow jacket is doing? That's the command to a pilot, if there was a pilot there, to take off. So they're actually integrating this autonomous flying. You can see the aircraft coming back into um, land here, but it's integrated into the socio-technical system in a perfectly um, normal way. It's a textbook landing. He's picked up um, the, the correct um, wire across the deck and pulled to a halt. And you see all these people walking around quite nonchalantly as if this is normal. I guess if you work on an aircraft carrier and have you know, several hundred tons of, of metal traveling past you at high speed, you get used to it. And whether there's a pilot there or not, maybe it doesn't make that much difference. Um, Closer to home, or at least in, in, in Scandinavia, um, it, it's going to be sort of a maritime uh, example. So this little tug, she's about um, 28 meters, um, has been um, modified by uh, people in Rolls-Royce in conjunction with a company called um, Svitzer. Um, again, this is remotely controlled, not fully um, autonomous, but I want to explain a little bit about what's been done here. Um, what the guys in, in Rolls did, some in, some in Norway, but um, led out of, uh, of Finland um, primarily, have built this remote um, operations center. Um, you can see the ship captain here, um, surrounded by a bunch of, of screens for giving him control. But what he actually has is um, very good situational awareness um, from systems using um, optical uh, radar and, and, and LIDAR to, to build a synthesized um, view. And so he's also got a rear view camera. Um, I, I understand that the intention is to build things like, like wing mirrors because that's also useful to see down the side. At this point, I should say he's got better situation awareness than he would do on the bridge on a normal vessel, partly through the sensors, but also partly through the signal um, processing. There are a number of, uh, of demonstrations of this in, in a harbour in, in, in Copenhagen, uh, and this diagram um, shows some of this. So the, the vessel was taken um, out of its berth by uh, a captain on board, handed over to the guy in the remote operations centre, um, sailed around the harbour, turned around, and then given back to the onboard um, pilot. This was done uh, with oversight from Lloyd's Register, who, who do uh, assessment of naval vessels. I think it did about 16 um, hours of, of operation. So this is a, a step towards uh, remote control of um, commercial uh, vessels. And their aim probably is the first um, commercial operations that will actually um, make money uh, for the operators are going to be operating um, ferries. And there's, there's other similar work being done. So although we talk about automotive a lot, and I will say more about that, I think one of the interesting things is this technology has been applied in, in many, many domains. Um, I said I was going to talk about challenges to um, orthodox approaches to, to safety. And I'll do that. And also say something um, in a moment about how we might address some of the challenges. And I say the, the observations from uh, Hakan, if that's how you pronounce it, before and Christopher this morning, I, th I think are very relevant. And I'll try to link back to those where I can. Actually, there are many, many um, different challenges, hence the dot, 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 um, from autonomy itself. Um, many of these systems use some form of machine learning and adapt to the environment they're in. Many of them are systems of systems where multiple systems interact with one another. Um, driving vehicles on a road is an obvious example, but it's also true in a maritime environment. If you take that little um, tug as an example, if I want to bring, say, a 60,000 ton vessel into harbor, I might need to send out four tugs, and those four need to operate with the main vessel that's pulled in. We heard a lot about state of intended function. I, I want to look at it from one slightly different perspective here, but again, build on the previous talk. And human interaction um, is an issue. Again, many of the things I've talked about, uh, talked so far, have uh, dealt with the fact we need humans to interact with these systems. So let me talk about this. Um, so 
autonomous systems and assurance. If decisions are made by a computer, how do you know that they're good, good enough, appropriate? And there are also ethical questions. Again, actually, I agree with the previous speaker. I think the trolley problem is um, a bit of a red herring, a bit of a, of, of a myth when you deal with fully um, autonomous systems. And actually, a good autonomous car will do future planning, do strategical um, work enough that it never gets into that situation. Or if it does, it's become something completely uncontrollable uh, has, has occurred, like somebody's fallen off a bridge. But this is difficult because modern autonomous systems use machine learning, a type of artificial intelligence. And so to me, one of the fundamental questions is, how do we know that what has learned is, is right, I put right in quotes, is valid, appropriate, safe enough, um, different ways of interpreting right. But if we know that technically, then how can we communicate to users, to the public, to regulators that the systems um, are safe to operate? So there's a technical issue, but there's also one of uh, communication to stakeholders. We heard a little bit earlier about um, neural networks um, and, and deep learning and, and so on. This little picture here is just a sort of classical um, multi-layer um, neural network. Um, one of the challenges from a safety perspective is the way most of these networks learn is that what's learned is invisible. Um, these little um, neurons in the layers um, learn weights, if you like, parameters. They multiply the input by some value. Uh, and propagate it. And they learn those from the training sets. But usually what's learned is internal. So how can I reason about something that I don't know what it does, because I don't know what it's learned? And that's a problem um, with an individual system. But what happens if they learn from others in a system of systems is what is learned appropriate. And Tesla will tell you one of the benefits of their vehicles is they learn from, from others, the data shared through the cloud. I have a friend in the UK who um, drives a Tesla, and he was driving down one of the highways there with his wife when this car suddenly started to slow down, even though there was no apparent reason. And his wife said, oh, what's it doing? Why? And his immediate response was, I don't know, but I can't tell my wife that. And he suddenly thought, oh, I know. There used to be roadworks here. And it's probably learned from the previous Teslas that went down here when there were roadworks, and the speed limit was 50, not 70, so it was actually dropping the speed because it knew there were roadworks there, except there weren't anymore. Um, so it's hard enough, I think, on a single system, but when you're learning from others in the system of systems, how do you know what's learned appropriate? Um, and since it's... Um, after lunch, I thought I should try to wake you up. This, this is a little um, clip out of an American film. I forget how old it is, 1980s or 1990s, something like that. And let's see if this plays. So this lady is in a car driven by an alien who, to confuse her, has actually taken on the form of her dead husband. So hopefully we get the sound here. But he's driving along. Oh, we don't get the sound. She's beginning to look worried. So I have to explain. So here's a yellow light at the intersection. And here's a truck, and he goes past at very high speed. Truck swerves, other things hit him. And so unfortunately, you don't have, ha have the sound, so I should explain. She's saying, what are you doing? And he said, you know, how have you done, done this? He says, I was watching you driving very carefully. When it's green, you carry on. When it's red, you stop. When it's yellow, you go very, very fast. <laughs> OK? So, um, Actually, typical human driver. Anybody ever done that? Yes. So, you know, um, so, so he's explaining he was learning very carefully and doing exactly what um, she showed him to do. So, you know, th th there's a, a funny side to this, of course, but there's a really serious technical problem about how do we learn these things. Um, if I think um, about a different sort of system, system. this is um, a, a project I had some input to um, many years ago. These so-called smart highways or intelligent highways are now quite widely um, used um, in the UK and I think el elsewhere. But originally, this is a motorway around a city called Birmingham. It was three lanes wide and had what we call um, a hard um, shoulder, um, different terms in, in American um, English. To, um, widen the motorway 
to be four lanes all the way and still have a hard shoulder would have cost about 500 million pounds. Um, by adding a bunch of things in the road and these gantries and occasional uh, emergency refuge areas, about one every kilometre, cost about 100 million pounds. So there was a, an economic drive to have this intelligent highway. And so the idea is that there are um, induction loops um, in the road that detect um, vehicles passing, work out vehicle um, speed, um, and they then set speed limits over each lane um, individually um, so that um, the drivers will um, slow down accordingly. This is not autonomous, so you could imagine if this was autonomous, you could transmit commands um, to the vehicles. But here they tried to make the drivers, the humans, autom automatons because they've got cameras over the lanes that do number plate recognition. And if you go through at 50 when it says 40, you'll get a letter in the post asking you to pay them 80 pounds uh, for, for breaking uh, the speed limit. What was interesting with this was actually doing a safety analysis. Um, because actually, if you think about it in terms of um, accidents per um, road kilometre or something like that, it actually has to be better than perfect. Because this is going to work. You'll get more traffic through. So it's bound to be more dangerous, even though it's trying to improve safety. Um, so there were some challenges there. So some things were done in a perfectly classical way. So on the signs, they did failure modes and effects analysis to work out um, the failure modes. So if something fails and goes blank, then you actually have to ch change um, the setting um, of, of the signs uh, around those and so on. But if you like, a little bit of inspiration we had in dealing with this was analysing at a much more abstract level, um, analysing sets of rules for setting the signals. So if I um, look at the example here, um, I might have on one gantry all 50s, including having the hard shoulder um, open, and then you know 50s at, at, at the next one. Um, or I might have something here where I've got um, the, the, the lane closed, um, and again, I've got 50s on the main motorway. So the two things that we um, looked at were analysing the rules for setting these signals but also um, the, the transitions. So if you look at this, what it's saying is if I've got on one of these signals, um, AMI, it's, it's aut automated motorway indicator, but just a signal. So I've got a, a 50. I can't, at the next um, gantry, have a stop or a red X, but I can have a 20. Um, so the analysis here that's within the competence of drivers to drop um, 30 miles an hour of speed in one kilometer between these gantries, what they normally were. And so somebody 30 or 40 um, would be safe. And from 60, um, you can drop to 30, but not to 20. So the rules about transitions between these gantries, but more interestingly was when something changed. So imagine, despite all these signs, there was an accident here. You have to propagate back um, lane closing. And, and what there actually was, was a, um, an optimization. It's effectively minimizing the risk. If you immediately did um, a red X here, then according to these rules, I'm going to cause an accident. But you have to propagate that back as quickly as possible. So we actually worked out um, with the um, highway um, experts um, ways of, of minimizing the risk e exposure there. So, that was novel. I actually think it's quite relevant because systems of systems to work properly have to have some rules whereby they operate. And I'll, I'll come back to that later on. So I said I was going to talk about problems. That, that's one example strategy because it's a bit boring having um, problems and no solutions. But let me um, describe a, another situation. So the idea of this, if it plays, is to illustrate um, how uh, automated lane keeping functions work. So a vehicle driving down a lane um, synthesizes, it works out where it thinks the middle of the lane is. And if it starts to drift, it will um, give you a little warning on the dashboard, but, but move you back. And it then shows you it moving the, the, the other way and, and gently um, steering. And so, I mean, that's an intended function. Um, we should ask, is it safe in all 
situations, does it interact safely with other functions uh, and other um, systems? And there was actually a recent um, Tesla um, accident where um, a car on autopilot hit a barrier where the lane narrowed, um, which suggests I also ought to ask the question about does it interact safely uh, with, with the environment as, as well. Interesting, I recently drove a Volvo XC40 with one of these lane following functions. Uh, so we should also add the question, is it disturbing to the driver? Because it was actually quite jerky. That video showed nice smooth transitions, but I think there's quite a lot of hysteresis in the control loop. So you got quite a long way off the center line, and then it jerks you back. It's actually quite disconcerting to drive, and you know maybe we got the parameters set up wrongly. So there are lots of questions there, and I will come back to human interaction. Um, in, in just um, a moment, actually, the next slide. So if something is, is totally autonomous, AD or HAD, as the previous speaker said, then human interaction is pretty limited. Probably the, the biggest concern there is public acceptance of the technology. But in, in many, many situations, we have um, shared autonomy. The system and humans can have distinct decision responsibilities, but those responsibilities um, can vary. Again, thinking about the, the previous talk, um, the system knows something about the functional capability, and outside that capability, it hands back responsibility to the human. And if you think about automated highway driving, imagine I want to do a, a highway chauffeur. When I get on the motorway, I give the control to the car. Um, when it comes off, I get the control back, so that's on, on leaving the highway. But it might be that I get control back um, under emergencies. So how does the system manage that I have enough situation, situational awareness? I can do that um, reliably. Also in this context, there's a the notion, uh, notion of social cognition. Um, humans um, perceive and predict the behavior um, of others. Um, when you drive on the road, you're doing this all the time. You're judging how other drivers will behave. Um, even if you can't see their faces or their eyes, you still look at the way the vehicles are behaving um, on the road and adjust um, accordingly. So if I'm going to have an autonomous system, how do I as a human predict their behavior? Because they're behaving like machines, not people. And uh, again, the previous speaker talked about the fact you know, when you start driving, or no, not the previous, sorry, the, uh, Christopher, I think, was saying that you know, when you start driving, you've had you know, 16 years of sitting in cars, and you know how vehicles behave, or you might have driven a bicycle. Um, actually, the autonomous system doesn't have that, so they'll behave in a particular way. But also, I, as a human driver, am not used to it. So how do I predict their behavior? And how do they predict? my behavior. This matters in driving, but also matters with collaborative robots. You know, if I'm going to work with, a, with a, a robot that's helping me in social care, and I need help to raise you know, a glass of water, I raise it to my lips, how do we manage the coordination there so it knows when I'm tipping, or if I've tipped it too far and I'm going to wet myself, how does it gently take it away from me so I don't cause a mess? And, and these interactions, I don't think we understand very well. And, and human beings are um, very subtle, and, and, and things are very situation awareness. Anybody here ever been to Hanoi? Ah, right. So this is a, a hazard warning if you go to Hanoi. Um, when I first went, I was told there's a very clear way of crossing the road safely. What you do is you walk in a straight line at a constant speed and don't make eye contact with the vehicles. And I really wasn't convinced about that. Um, whoops, hang on. And then I went there. Sorry. Let's do that. So this is um, Hanoi. Um, notice this gentleman is quite elderly, so clearly this strategy does work quite well. And so. Here is the gentleman crossing the road. Actually, you notice there's a pedestrian crossing here, which he's ignoring entirely, because it makes not the slightest difference to his safety. And he walks across. He actually cheats for about the last meter. You see, when he gets there, he runs, but he, he, he knows he's safe. Um, so you know, the drivers all expect pedestrians crossing the road to behave like that, and vice versa. So it works. Um, I, 
you know, I, I don't know how you make uh, autonomous vehicles do that because it will violate all the rules about minimum separation and so on. In fact, it would be a field day for people in Halle. They'd be able to cross the road all the, all the time. And I've done that, and it is, it is quite scary. Um, so what I want to summarise out of this bit is actually why um, assurance is hard. To me, uh, assurance means confidence or certainty in assistance ability. And I think, I think Peter earlier used the term confidence, and I think we use it in exactly the same way. Um, well, can we test for it? I think the simple answer is, is, is no. Um, again, you mentioned the statistical things, but just to give some different numbers, my, my understanding is that in the West, we do about 3.7 million miles between um, fatalities in cars with drivers. Um, you know, part of that is down to passive safety systems and so on. There's a little company in the UK called Oxbotica, who I think are the most competent um, developers of, of independent automotive driving systems you know, outside the, the major manufacturers. Their systems have done 10,000 miles. That's quite impressive. Although it's not a lot of 3.7 million. But actually, they've done 10,000 miles um, on the same um, little piece of estate. So is that 10,000 miles, or is that one mile 10,000 times? What does it tell it? Can we prove it? I said about neural networks that often what these things have learned is, is invisible. It's not just neural networks. If it's invisible, how do we reason about it? And how do you know we've covered all the scenarios? And again, the previous talk illustrated some of those problems. I think the second part of this is you know, these things not being fully autonomous. How do the human operated and um, autonomous systems understand each other, in quotes. So how, how do they work together, whether it's a handover from an autonomous mode to a manual mode, or whether it's different systems sharing a, a space um, interaction? And, and how do we ensure the human has a sufficient awareness uh, of the situation? Um, Psychologists that I, that I know in, in New York tell me if you, that they think if you have fully autonomous driving and you switch back to manual mode, it takes about 20 seconds to rebuild awareness of the situation. You might have two seconds at best. So how do we make that work? And I've already mentioned this thing about how, you know, social cognition, how we judge what happens. So that sounds pretty bleak. Um, are there some strategies for addressing the problems? Well, I've already told you one about system of systems, which is, say, elevate your safety reasoning to the level of, of rules of operation. I want to say something about um, safety of, of learning systems, um, including exposing the learning, but also dynamic approaches to risk management, safety attended functions, and a bit about risk management, and a bit about images, which um, I'm, some things I want to ask you more about what you've been doing. So in terms of um, understanding um, machine learning, some years ago we developed a variant of, of neural networks which we called um, SCAN, but these were deliberately designed so they exposed a, a model of, of the learned behavior, if you like, the weights of the, of the network nodes, so we could reason about safety. Did a number of applications, one of which was um, controlling some parts of, a, of an aircraft engine known as inlet guide vanes. And effectively, what the network did is it exposed the transfer function it had learned between inputs and, and outputs on that valve, so you could actually reason about um, its behavior. It's a general approach. You can do this with um, other technologies, such as reinforcement learning. But that's I'm not saying it's the only way, but it's one way of making it possible to reason about um, these systems. I, I personally don't believe, and we might want to argue about this, you can do these things black box for critical application because you simply don't know if there are gaps in what's being learned. Um, what are alternative um, a, a approaches? Well, I've, I've mentioned this, but actually in Europe now we have this general um, data protection regulation which requires an explanation of decisions made by artificial intelligence. Um, in the UK, there's a body called the Information Commissioner's Office, and they're responsible for a number of things, including implementing this um, legislation. They say they think it applies perfectly well to embedded systems, um, as it does to, say, an information system giving you um, guidance about whether you can get a mortgage. Um, so, in some sense, I think we're going to find there are some legal requirements for explanations, which maybe help the safety case. 
So um, another possibility would be to constrain the learning. One of the things that we've done uh, with reinforcement learning is set it up with um, multiple um, objectives um, where some of those are, are safety goals. So it's learnt some performance, learnt some behaviour, but done so constrained by the safety goals. And the other thing would be actually to un update the understanding of risk d dynamically. And to me, there are two aspects of this. That the design is explicitly risk aware and that we do safety cases or assurance cases dynamically. Um, and again, back to the, the previous conversation, what was being described with these, you know, um, ACLD versus ACLB, et cetera, regions, which expanded under bad weather and shrank again, actually that's doing, uh, it's adjusting to risk dynamically. Um, now, it doesn't necessarily mean that the system directly has a, a risk variable, but I think in, in time we probably do need to do that. But it seems to me that systems do work like that um, already, but we might want to make it more explicit. i speak very um, briefly um, about this little diagram at the top is meant to show very abstractly what we've done with um, some areas of, of reinforcement learning. So an agent carries out some action on an environment, it monitors what happens, it gets a reward depending on whether that was good or bad. Uh, and, and here in the training, the reward includes um, a safety function. The diagram at the, at the bottom is some work being done at the Technical University of Munich where the guys there are actually working on um, state machines for controlling systems where some of these transitions are explicitly mitigation actions triggered by um, monitoring levels of risk. And then the diagram on the, the, the right is again, um, work in York, if you, if you like, this is quite aspirational, saying if we're going to build a dynamic safety case, we have to monitor the environment analyze what's happening, um, respond to it, and, and so on, and go around. And then what we have to monitor is you know, real-world data uh, you know, from driving, um, maybe changes in organizational practices and culture and so on. So it's meant to be a very broad-based model of how you do dynamic safety cases. Can't do that today, um, but that's the sort of thing we're trying to work towards. Um, the previous talk talked a great deal um, about um, safety of intended um, function. I just have a very um, simple um, example of this, of uh, emergency braking, you know, stopping the vehicle in the event of obstacle detection. But as already been mentioned, stopping like that could lead to um, a rear-end collision, which is a hazard. In some senses, I don't think SOTIF is anything new. I think in some senses it is, but in some senses it's not. But to me, then, actually we need to assess that as part of our normal hazard analysis, but we also need to consider function interactions with our own system, our own vehicle, and others in the system of systems. Now, I think we can do this by adapting functional hazard analysis, and I, you know, there are various papers on that already. So I think in terms of the hazard analysis, it's not very very different. Again, the previous speaker was saying, actually, are these SOTIF hazards ISO 26262 hazards? And I think many of them actually are. We just have new ways of, ways of causing the hazards rather than um, new hazards. But I think there's a, another area where there's a, a challenge relating to risk management. I mean, traditionally, we assume that for simple um, hardware elements, we can quantify um, failure rates or at worst, we can assess risk um, qualitatively and we can rank risk via a hazard risk index. So you say, you know, the well-known stuff we, can, we believe we can quantify, uh, where we can't, we say, well, we can still rank these. And that's what you know, the ACIL tables and many other things do. But we're now moving towards um, a world where there's much more uncertainty. Autonomy, I've said, here, introduces uncertainty. Actually, I think that's not quite true. I think it means that the uncertainty that we've always faced, we can no longer um, ignore because it's too important in what we do. So we need a process that manages uncertainty um, in accepting systems into operation. So for example, progressive usage, and again, gentlemen before were saying, actually, we, we operate this thing in a domain we understand, get some more confidence, expand, the sphere of operation, gain some more confidence, expand it again. I think we have no option but to do that for dealing with uncertainty. 
But I also think there's quite a fundamental challenge to the safety world. We've tended to assume implicitly that you know the normal system um, is safe enough, and we have to worry about risks if things fail. I think SOTIF somewhat alters that. But also, if you think about things like autonomous driving, one of the original motivations, the guys at, at Google doing this, wanted to develop these things because they knew that reckless driving um, led to accidents. And uh, Sebastian Thrum at, at Google had a, a friend of his killed, I think, at the age of, of 17 by doing what 17-year-old boys will, will do. So it's intended to bring benefits. So we need to balance the risk against the benefits. This is a terrible acronym, which I will change when I think of a better one. But I think we need to do um, a much more dynamic um, trade-off between um, risk and, and benefit. And we need to look at the risk of, of malfunction and balance that against the benefits of normal operations, um, including autonomy. It's dynamic because risk varies over time, and it may be minutes or hours or whatever. Um, in a sense, you know, the, the, the example we were given about increasing you know, the um, ACIL-D area for the sensors um, when a truck comes back comes past you when it's raining is an example of a very short time frame, seconds. Um, but actually, if systems just learn over a long period of time, then their capability um, will change. I think there's a really big um, shift here. Um, always we've said that the safety process should influence design. But if we're going to move to a more dynamic notion of risk, I think ultimately we'll find we'll end up using risk as a runtime uh, concept. Uh, I think that would draw together what I said about dynamic risk assessment, dynamic safety cases, and so on. This is much more speculative, but I think we potentially need a really big um, paradigm shift this way. And it just might be that it helps in terms of public acceptance. If you can say, actually, the system is aware of risk, and it will back off, it will take more conservative decisions if it's aware that the risk is increasing. That might be that something that helps us um, communicate um, this to, to the public. And you know, lots of people I've, I've, I've talked to um, about autonomous cars um, say they would really not trust it um, for all sorts of reasons. But actually, the people, on the other hand, who say, actually, Drivers are terrible. I, you know, I really want this sort of technology. And it tends to be the extremes and not in the middle. And it might be that things like this would actually help you to have a more balanced conversation. Um, there are um, a number of specific problems around autonomous um, systems. We've heard quite a lot about um, image analysis, image understanding. I think that's really um, critical. Um, Sensing analysis is very difficult. We, we've heard about this, and you know, the false positives and false negatives are a real challenge. Um, the diagram on the right is something that we did um, a long time ago. We were trying to um, help uh, with an, an automated landing system that would go beyond the current CAT3 systems. And all you had to do was to find the center line on the runway. OK, this is by the terminal. You're interested on, on the runway. Um, but this just shows the difficulty. We wanted to find this yellow line, but the sensors were good enough to detect all the cracks in the concrete. Also, it thought this was the horizon, which is slightly alarming. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, it's really obvious to you and I that this is you know, the line you're meant to follow. But because the sensors are very sensitive, they pick up these things. And of course, there's breaks in the line. So you can't just say it's going to be the continuous thing that's the real line. And we spent a bit of time working on how to do safety assessment of this. We didn't know how to at the time. And that we have to do now with these new systems. Um, one possible way I've been discussing with some, some guys I worked with in the past in, in, in PISA is say, you know, there may be some benefits with these things for adapting principles from reuse. In reuse, they talk about three Cs. Reusing the concept, reusing the context of the environment in which it works, and the contents of the learned algorithms. And I think, if nothing else, we should ask ourselves the question, actually, is this concept valid moving from this environment to another? Does my concept of, say, lane following um, that works on clear roads work on roads covered in snow? And if it doesn't, that should be one of the things I exclude from my operational um, uh, d d domain, as, as was explained previously. 
We also saw some examples of the challenges with sensors. The examples I have here are, are pretty much the same as was shown before, except this bottom left-hand one um, may be interesting. So very heavy woolen overcoats can affect the performance of ultrasonic sensors. So if you're in Austria and buy a Loden overcoat, um, you become less visible to ultrasonic sensors. So it'll keep you warm and dry, um, but it has some... Um, um, undesired consequences. So, you know, the, the real difficulties here in understanding uh, our sensing technology and the other technologies as, as, as well. So, what I want to do is to talk very briefly about this new program um, that, that's, that's been set up um, based in York and then draw a few conclusions. Um, there's a, a body in the UK called the Lloyd's Register Foundation. The Lloyd's Register Group is an assurance company that's been looking at shipping um, for, for more than 250 years and doing assessments of um, stability and, and, and so on uh, of vessels. They now work in many, many more um, domains. They're owned by a foundation, which is a charity, and the charitable aims about protection of, of life and the environment. They've done a number of reviews of, of various technologies and, and things including robotics and autonomous systems. And so they published something in October 2016 on robotics and autonomous systems. It's about 60 pages. Um, the um, very short summary of, of that report says that actually robotics and autonomous systems have benefits, but there's a real gap in assurance and regulation of robotics and autonomous systems. And it needs to catch up with and positively influence the technology development. And in essence, they saw, in many cases, although not all, technology being developed and being deployed without people thinking about the assurance aspects and the regulatory aspects. As a long story short, um, we were successful in getting funding from the foundation to implement um, a program uh, of, of research for five years starting this January um, to look at some of these problems. Now, it's an interesting um, program in, in many, many ways. Um, it says here it's led and directed from York, and I, I'm fortunate enough to be the, the, the inaugural director of that. But it's meant to work internationally, um, so to have worldwide potentially collaborators, hence the um, international um, in the title of the program. Um, there's four main strands of work here. Um, to me, the most important is the first one. It's working on assurance and regulation to do with real-world prototype systems or demonstrator systems, if, if you like. I say this because the, the, the space you have to consider is just truly enormous. I mean, it's hard enough for a single system, such as a car, but trying to solve this problem generically, which we're meant to, is incredibly difficult. So. Um, to me, the most important thing is working with people developing real-world systems to um, help on the assurance and regulatory um, aspects. And the way the program works, we can actually fund the people who are developing those things to do some of this work. There needs to be some um, basic research and Two areas that we currently have um, underway are on dynamic risk that I've mentioned, but also on assurance of, of AI, currently particularly focused on, on deep reinforcement um, learning. Um, but we think many of the methods also apply to other things, such as deep neural networks. But we'll find out. We have a, a, another um, activity in the area of education um, and, and training, which is um, just getting um, un underway over the next a um, few months, um, but we're going to start trying to do some training needs analysis of what people need to understand in the development community about safety processes, in the safety community about the capability of um, uh, robotics, autonomous systems, machine learning, and so on. And I say this is meant to operate internationally, so one of the things we need to do is to um, run some international activities, but to liaise with organizations and activity uh, around the world. This international perspective is, is important to the program, very much comes from what the foundation says, because um, they recognize that many of the problems are global and need harmonized regulation. You know, a simple uh, example, if I go to the maritime world, is you know, if, if I have a, a vessel that sails from um, Stockholm um, you know, down through um, 
Baltic waters, goes into Rotterdam, comes out, goes through the North Sea, the English Channel, and round to Singapore. It's probably gone through five or six different jurisdictions in, in doing that, five or diff six different regulators. You want to decide how to assure it and regulate it once, not six times. So actually getting harmony in this is really important. There is an international maritime organization, but again, like other domains, th the, the reality of people developing and deploying systems is way ahead of where the regulators uh, actually are. So where are we? Um, as I mentioned, the um, programme started on the 1st of, uh, of, of January. Um, we've got um, agreement in principle to set up um, the first um, four or five um, demonstrator projects. Um, the first um, four are UK, Italy, um, Sweden, and I think the, um, the fifth one is likely to be in, in, in Japan, but we've still got a little bit more work to do on that. They cover a range of domains. as a couple in healthcare, one focused on an intensive care unit, the other more on um, social care. There's one in manufacturing, um, the Swedish one is in quarrying, and the, the Japanese one will be in the automotive domain if all goes ahead. So we're in the process of sorting out contracts to get those um, up and running. The basic research, research is, is starting. One thing I didn't mention is, in many ways, the key deliverable um, from this is meant to be um, a body of knowledge, so you know, a widely available um, um, repository of information to, to help people. And the body of knowledge should explain things you know, like the state of the art in developing or assuring um, particular um, sorts of technologies. Again, so some of what uh, Christopher was talking about this morning is the sort of thing, if it matures and works, we would want to refer to um, from the body of knowledge. I think it's also important to include some principles. And again, you know, the, the previous speaker from Senuity talked about you know, some principles for designing um, systems so that they actually have safe behavior, but also so they're assurable. And some of those are some of the sorts of things that we need to do as, as well. In education and training, um, we don't have people in post yet, but hope to soon. Um, and the first step here is to do a proper training needs analysis to understand what's um, needed. And it may be that we actually start off with some um, short training material that's really around um, uh, awareness and perhaps focused on the regulators. My experience is the development community understand this technology much better than the regulators, so the regulatory space may be the best place to start. It's also important we link with other industry and academic projects. Um, you know, we have 10 million over five years, 10 million pounds, not krona. Sounds like quite a lot of money. Then you divide it by saying, oh, it's worldwide, so there's 186 nations. Um, it's all the domains of application. It's all the technologies. Oh, that's about five krona, uh, a, a subcategory. It's, it's not possible. So we have to build this international um, collaboration so we can work with others, but draw on what they're doing to produce this um, body of knowledge. So it's a fascinating uh, challenge that will keep me interested for a few years um, to, to come. But let me um, draw a few conclusions uh, from this. There are um, many potential benefits from robotics and autonomous systems across a wide range of domains. The benefits come in you know, many forms, taking people um, out of harm's way so they don't have to do um, dangerous activities. An area I've not mentioned is actually supporting um, offshore activities, whether it's in the oil and gas industry or um, things like wind turbines. You know, we send people onto these big structures such as wind turbines or uh, onto oil and gas platforms to do inspection. If you do that autonomously, perhaps with the UAV, then you can take people out of harm's way. Um, the care example I had with the, with the, ro um, you know, the, the healthcare robot earlier on, so we can provide effective care uh, for people as well. And we can potentially eliminate or reduce um, sources of human error in some classes of application. But safety assurance and regulation is a key um, focus. And um, some people think, oh, if you're trying to do this, you're trying to stop people deploying things. Well, actually, we're not. We're trying to help people deploy things that are actually safe and they're positive about having um, deployed. Now, 
you know, some companies are well aware of the issues, and you know, my experience is that you know, the automotive guys are perhaps more aware of some of these challenges than in other um, domains, but there's a big gap in, in technical capability and competence um, in, in some areas. Um, some aren't even really asking themselves the question, and those gaps also include in, uh, you know, uh, are in regulation. Um, and people have rightly said that you know, standards are not regulations, are not the laws, but some of the regulations that exist say things that actually prevent you from deploying this stuff, or say things that are, are potentially dangerous. Um, some of the regulations in the maritime environment you know, say, under these failure conditions, you should stop. So I have 60,000 tons going along at four knots, and it says I should stop. Well, I possibly can't, even if I can. If the reason I have a problem is because I'm in a part of the ocean where I don't have good communication off the vessel, stopping in a place where I can't communicate is a really bad idea. Or if I'm at the entrance to a harbour and I'm blocking the only safe channel in and out, that's a bad idea as well. So I think trying to influence regulations so they're more um, practical and sensible is really a, a very important. So my program is intended to address these problems. We can't solve all of them by ourselves by any means. We maybe can't solve very many um, by ourselves. So what I'd like to do is to encourage people um, to, to get, in, get in touch. Um, so there's a website, there's not much on it yet, but you can also um, email us at the address at the bottom and we'll give you um, news when there's some to give. But I so say probably in terms of these sorts of demonstrator programs, there'll be another call for those um, in, in July. Uh, and so hopefully we can engage with some of the people here in those sorts of, of areas. So ladies and gentlemen, thanks for your patience and I'm glad we made this technology work, even if my reliable Mac wouldn't. Thank you. Thank you, John. So we have time for question. If I wait for a question, I should apologize to, to Peter. Um, mandatory is in some of the derivative standards from 61508, such as the railway ones. It's not in 61508 itself. M my, my memory let me down. My apologies. It's given people to have time to think of questions. Or is it coffee time? Yeah, it's coffee time. And they can grab you at, uh, at that with that, those questions. So thank you again. OK, thank you. <laughs> Cheers. OK, thank you very much. Cheers. Okay.